I've taken, you know, hundreds and hundreds of implant CE courses over the last several years. And this topic is something that is really not addressed, uh, or at least very in a very cursory manner. And so the immediate molar concept uh, for implants is something that is, that is exciting. And from what uh, our presenter says is, uh, if you do implants, it's really not that difficult. And so I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Azim Sheikh. Uh, he's a general dentist. He's been practicing for over 17 years in Brampton, the GTA. Um, he's a Western grad right here in London, Ontario, which makes me like him even more back in 2003. Uh, he's the owner of Brampton Dental Arts, where he focuses mainly on perio and implant dentistry. He's placed over 4,000 uh, dental implants, and uh, he's the course director um, in the master's implant program for High Austin Canada. Um, also, he's the founder of the Ontario Dental Implant Network. So if you place implants, um, he's been kind enough to allow me to join his group. And while I've been drowning in the hundreds of emails that I get uh, every single day from that group, um, it is very interactive, very solid group. And I believe he's been letting people uh, join on a, on a trial basis. And I thank him for that. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's been a great network. I've become a big fan on the last uh, few months of uh, Dr. Azim, and I'm really looking forward to his talk. So. Hope you enjoy everybody and go ahead, Azim. It's all yours. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Haas. I'm just going to share my screen here and we'll make sure we are good to go. I think we're all, we're all becoming, we've all become Zoom experts as of now. So, all right. So we should be pretty good. Everybody's okay there. We can see that. You're good to go, Azim. Awesome. Let me just, perfect. Okay. All right. So good morning, everybody. I'm excited uh, to be with you all on this rainy Monday, uh, Victoria Day, that is. Um, hope you guys are all enjoying time with your families. Um, and really uh, speaking on, to speak on a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, the, the implants or the number of implants that you kind of heard has mentioned, all of which have mostly been immediate implants. Um, so, you know, I get a lot of questions on socket grafting. Oh, okay, if I take out the tooth, uh, what's the best way to socket graft? And I really don't know. I don't do, I do very minimal socket grafting. 99% uh, of my cases are immediate implants. And um, I'm excited to share how to really start that journey, how to get yourself into this field of dentistry. And you'll see the topic is immediate molar to immediate anterior. And some people say, well, why did you choose that topic? Wouldn't it be immediate anterior to immediate molar? And the answer is actually no. We're, and we're going to talk about why I, that top, why, why I chose that word in particular. Um, in, in particular. So, um, again, just uh, I did want to thank uh, Hisham and, every, you know, and, and the Dentistry Academy in particular. I don't think everybody realizes when, when Hisham first had the vision for this track master series, I'm like, dude, this is a lot of work. What are you getting out of it? He said, you know what I'm getting out of it? I'm giving back to my community. I'm giving back. I'm like, I mean, this is just amazing for us to have these types of lectures, these speakers. And, and I don't think everybody realizes how much effort goes into this, um, really, and, and the quality and, and everything. So again, uh, for those of you who haven't liked him on Facebook, I don't know, send him a gift, do something to give back to this guy to this man, but I mean, he's just done so much for our dental community. And I think especially during these times where everybody needed it. So thank you, Hisham. Um, so again, uh, just, uh, you know, Haas already read all this stuff out, but I did want to reiterate the implants that I've been doing have mostly, 99% of them have been immediates. And again, these are not just for my patients. These are for referrals. So some doctors say, oh, this guy's doing immediates. Okay, well, how do we know if they're failing? I would not be getting referrals. <laughs> Again, if I was having failures, right? Um, because I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm privy to those other dentists who are sending me these cases. So they're working, right? They're clearly working and patients are clearly happy. So, um, you know, I guess this is where um, and everybody wants to now start getting into immediate implants because obviously they realize that there can be a high success rate and we do have a high success rate with them. So uh, make sure that you visit. I mean, I do have a website. Um, it's called livedentalsurgery.com. Um, I've also got a Facebook group uh, or Facebook page, and I do post a lot of cases, and those cases have step-by-step. -step. So if you want to see an immediate molar or an immediate anterior, you can watch it step-by-step. -step. You can see the pictures. Um, also, check out my Instagram page. I post a lot of cases on that as well. Um, so just make sure you do like us on those. Um, so 
what is an immediate implant for those, you know, new, new dentists, you know, kind of wondering, okay, I learned about implant dentistry from LaPointe, you know, who basically doesn't tell you a lot about implants um, in dental school, but what is it? Well, it's basically when we remove the tooth at the same time, we place the implant. Okay, so that's what an immediate implant was, uh, is coined. And this term was reported back in 1976. So again, I have not very good at math, but I'm going to say that's 50 years ago, 50 years ago. So why is this all of a sudden now, maybe over the last, you know, several, you know, days or what have you, uh, several months be become a, a more of like a hot topic. And so now to further that, um, let's look at the studies, right? And, and the highest quality of studies, I don't know if you guys have seen like the, the totem pole on what makes studies the most genuine and the most authentic. And those studies are always systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Those are the highest level of studies that basically take generally all the studies, they put them all together, they do a review in depth. And so Chen did this review back in 20, I think it was 2015, 2014, sorry, I can't see because 2014. And, um, and uh, basically what, there, what he showed was that the implants, immediate anterior implants, whether it was delayed, in, uh, whether you're placing the implant the same day or whether you're waiting, actually you're getting the same results. And the same, the similar study in 2010, and this is again, this is like 10 years ago, showed that immediate, even with molars, um, you know, placing an implant into a molar site, whether it was done something delayed or whether it was done at the same time of implant placement, actually was giving you the similar results. Uh, so why are we not doing this? Why are we not doing this, right? I don't know. And I will argue that actually you will get a better result. We'll show you how. So here's an example. This is what we're going to talk about today, the immediate anterior. So of course, removing the anterior tooth, placing the implant the same day. Um, and then in some cases, depending on your level of expertise, going ahead and fabricating a tooth on it the same day. The same thing goes with immediate premolar. And now actually for first premolars, I typically tend to make the tooth the same day, but this just shows a picture of placing the immediate implant. The immediate molar, which is my love, which is my passion, which is what I'm gonna talk, spend a lot of time today talking about. And then of course, moving and transitioning over to something like a full arch, where we're again, removing all the teeth, and then, um, you know, in, in many cases, placing implants, and the patient leaving with a set of teeth the same day, and I can tell you those are very life-changing procedures. Um, so how do you start? Okay, so you either just got out of dental school or you've been placing implants for 10, 15 years. How do I start? How do I get into this field? And you know, I know you're thinking, wow, you know, I'm nervous. I'm scared. You know, what if this? What if that? I don't think I can do this. Bullshit. I shouldn't swear, right, Hashem? Shouldn't swear? Okay. So you can do this. You can totally do this. You just have to pick your cases. And this is exactly what we're going to talk about. But the first step is you have to take a training program. Okay. This is not me speaking. This is the RCDSO and their guidelines, which we teach on and I lecture on, you know, three times a year or twice a year when we do our basic implant training program on the guidelines. It's a 16 page document. It outlines basically what you should start off with, what is classified as an easy case and what's classified as a complex case. And, uh, and again, this is just the course that we teach through the Hyacin program. Um, and again, you, you know, the key and what I would encourage you all to do, and I've spoke about this before, um, is make sure that you align yourself with a course that has what I call super GPs. Um, again, I love specialists and I think they're great, but having some GPs allows you to really relate in a different way, I feel. And that's kind of what I've heard. Also, it, it behooves me to know that people have taken or spent thousands of dollars on courses and walk away from these courses and not feel comfortable placing an implant, right? And this is one of the reasons why I initially started and I helped start the High Awesome Basic Implant Training Program and then evolved to the Master Implant Training Program um, is to basically make sure that when doctors um, ultimately have completed their, um, you know, their training that they feel comfortable placing implants. That's my number one goal. Um, so what's great about the program also, and when you, when you start getting into implant placement, and when we start talking about immediates is you have to know how bone feels. 
And one of the things that I love with our training program is that we, get, we give these doctors these, these bone blocks. And you'll see like the bone blocks actually are made of wood and it gives you a nice feel for like what hard bone feels like, you know, so what D1, D2, D3, D4, because that's really what it's all about. It's, you know, I always talk about this becoming one with the bone and that's what's so, so awesome about implant dentistry is it's really like a game. It's like a chess match, you know, how are you going to manipulate the bone to do what you want it to do? And this is where things are so exciting in implant dentistry. It's not, you know, like a restoration. Okay. It's great. You, know, you can put some marginal grooves. You can do all these cool things in there. But when it comes to implant dentistry, it's just so much more exciting. There's so much more of a rush. Um, but you have to really understand and feel bone. And these are some of the ways that you can kind of understand it and get that feel. You also have to know to take, how to take out a tooth, right, with immediate implants. So understanding, and I know, you know, some of you are thinking like, oh, my God, a molar that's endotreated, that keeps fracturing, you know, and you're there for an hour trying to take this tooth out. God forbid, now I need to do a molar implant after that. So you have to know the instruments on what to use. And they're not a lot that you need. Something like a periotome, something like a luxating elevator, um, you know, how to remove the tooth atraumatically, I think is important for you to understand. And it's funny because, you know, when, when doctors ask me, you know, like, you know, I had to take out this molar and it, it took me like an hour. And I said, well, what did your flap look like at the beginning? I said, well, you know, there, there was no flap. And then I said, how did it look like at the end? Well, you know, there was, I had to drill the bone and remove the bone. I said, well, why didn't you just do that at the beginning? You know, why don't you just strategically remove the bone that you need to either a where your osteotomy is going to be, because if your osteotomy is going to make a hole, that's going to create some space and that'll allow you to remove your tooth even easier. Or you create some space around the tooth that doesn't compromise the buccal plate or the lingual plate. So I'm talking about going in approximately. We're going to talk about that. And then of course, using proper forceps like apical forceps there are forceps that will contour to the root to the apex and will minimize the risk of you fracturing the root or the tooth or whatever so it's having the proper tools and you don't need a lot you don't need to invest in a lot but you do need to have some good instrumentation and i think those are some of the key ones that i talked about are important to have when you're dealing with extractions and wanting to preserve the bone and the soft tissue because you know sometimes you've taken out that anterior and now you look at the tissue and you've just grabbed some of the tissue with the tooth right because your forceps was too big so these are some of the things that you have to be mindful of when you're doing immediates also so again we're talking about building our skills building our confidence number one obviously taking a basic implant training program like i talked about right and those basic implant training programs typically come with some live surgery so take advantage, get patience. I don't care if you have to get them off PGD, but get patience. Number two, feeling bone, practicing on these bone blocks, right? Taking out teeth atraumatically, which we just finished. Practicing, because we all take out teeth. Why not try to do it atraumatically, right? Spend a little bit more time, and I'll tell you, it'll take you less time once you get better on strategically how to take out the tooth. The third is to watch surgery, right? Come and watch surgery. This is how you learn. This is one of the benefits of our study club is I post all my lives here, all my surgeries on the website. Anybody here can go on and look at it. And, and as a member, you can come and you can say, hey, I wanna come watch you do a surgery. And then we discuss cases, we answer questions. And there's also a mentorship aspect to our study club whereby we can, you can actually bring a patient into my office. You don't feel comfortable doing an immediate molar or an immediate anterior, then I can help you with that. I can step in if we need to. And we're running a program or we were supposed to run a program with Hi, Austin, where uh, we were offering doctors to do that, you know, kind of like on a weekend, on a one-on-one. -on -one. Well, we have up to four doctors, but well, again, uh, you know, we'll keep you posted on that. So the key is, what case do I start with? Because at the end of the day, you don't want to start doing a case and then say, oh, Dr. Shea got me all pumped up to do immediate implants. And now all of a sudden you're like, damn, I, I, you know, I had a bad experience. I do not want to do this, right? It's like picking your first molar endo. You don't want to pick something that's on a patient who's like 90 years old, completely calcified canals, and now you're trying to do your first molar endo with an MB3 that you can't find, right? God damn. Anyways, so, God, I just had these flashbacks of MB2. But anyways, moving on. 
So, and, and to that point, if you can do a molar endo, there's no reason why you can't do implants. I mean, I, implants are way easier than doing endo. I can vouch for that for a fact, okay? Because actually when I first started my associateship, all I did was endo for two and a half years and I look forward to implants. But at the same time, you need to pick your cases properly. So uh, at the early, uh, this, I'll just give you an example, uh, a quick story about a doctor who approached me during the basic implant training program. She said, you know what, Dr. Sheikh, I've done a lot of extractions. This is early on when we just first started doing cases and we weren't really clear what was simple, what was difficult, what we could allow, what we couldn't allow. And so this doctor was like, I'm really confident I can do an immediate anterior. I'm like, you know what, good for you. You know what, I'm there for you. You can do this, take out the tooth, and then, you know, do your initial osteotomy. Went through the plan very strategically. And the day of surgery, she was all pumped and everything was good. And guess what happened? This. The crown fractured. She was there for 45 minutes trying to take out that tooth and couldn't take out the tooth. Okay, and I, and I, I should have put up the CT here. But if we looked at the CT, it would show that the patient actually had a bit of a curb on the root. There was a fracture in the root, and also the buccal plate was not was super thin, and uh, and she was very confident that she could get the tooth out. So what happens? Well, now she gets to watch me do an immediate implant. Um, so what happened was I had to jump in. Um, this is what happened. I had to raise a vertical flap to expose the site. There was a thin. I was able to maintain that thin buccal bone, uh, that thin little crestal bone. But when we started prepping that bone was gone. Okay, so this now became a super advanced case with a big buccal dehiscence, and I had to finish the case, basically. Because again, we promised the patient an immediate anterior, so that's what we delivered to her that day. Um, but I finished the case for her, and you will notice, I, I, and this is one of the little nuances with immediates, is you try to stabilize your implant. So here you'll see I use the floor of the nose, um, and then this is her final crown. I don't have the final picture, but this is about a year later, and everything worked out for her. But Lesson learned, we do not allow doctors to do immediate anteriors in a basic implant training program. That's advanced, right? Um, and uh, nor do we allow immediate molars or crustal sinus lifting, again, because the college has, has specific guidelines on what we can do and what we can and can't do. But the point being that when you pick your case, be very selective on what you're going to start with based on your experience level. So if you placed 100 implants or 50 implants, you may be able to get away with a bit of a harder case. But if you're just starting off with doing implants, then choose a simpler case. And, and some of you may be saying, well, I'm not going to do an immediate. And I'm going to say, no, you have to. You've got to push yourself to do an immediate implant. Yes, you do, after the basic implant training program. And I'm going to show you the cases today that you can select that will give you the confidence and the success to start incorporating this into your practice. The first step, and who is this man? Anybody? I have no clue. All I know is if this man walked into my practice, he would have, I would assume, very low expectations, even if we were doing an immediate anterior. Why? Because he covers everything when he smiles. There's a beautiful little mustache, you know, um, you know and, uh, and low expectations is where you need to start. Somebody who basically says, you tell them, Mrs. Jo Mr. You know, Han, I am going to remove your tooth and I'm going to attempt to place this implant, there's a high probability that I won't be able to do it. There's also a high probability that once I do do it, it's going to fail. Would you like to proceed? And he says, yes. You got nothing to lose at that point, right? Set the bar low, right? This is what you need to do. Versus a patient comes in and starts taking selfies, and ah, you see this, I want my tooth to just be a little bit shorter when you do the implant run the other way. In fact, what I do with those cases is I refer that to a periodontist I don't like. Sorry, Tina. No, I'm just kidding. I do love Tina. Um, she's amazing, but I'm, I'm just joking here. Um, or send this to a dentist down the street who you don't like, okay? But at the end of the day, high expectations run the other way. Do not start with those cases. They're very challenging. So here's an example. A patient has a lower molar with a cracked tooth. Saw an endodontist, there's a vertical fracture on the tooth, the tooth is deemed non-restorable. That's a good case to start with because it's in the back. The patient has low expectations. You're telling them, listen, there's this innovative procedure that was invented 50 years ago, okay, that um, we're gonna remove the tooth and we're gonna place the implant 
And there may be a probability we can't place the implant, in which fact we'll do what 99% of the rest of the population is doing, which is just grafting the case, and we'll come back and fight another day. Or we'll try, but there's a risk that it may not take. What would you like to do? And I guarantee your patient's going to say, you know what, I trust you, doctor so-and-so, and I'd like you to try. Okay, and again, you'll look at the CT and we'll go through the case and how to diagnose and treatment plan. Versus this is one of my patients who was a hygienist with a high smile line, who needed the 2-1 removed, had an apical infection due to resorption, and this was an extremely challenging case. I was able to successfully complete the case. Some of you who saw my immediate uh, implant lecture, you, will, you can find this. And you know what about the lectures that I've done anyways for, for Dentistry Academy? You know, we started off doing the immediate implant lecture, which really kind of highlights what's possible with immediate implants. Then my second lecture was on the 12 and a half steps to successful surgery. So how do you do those steps? And I think this is a nice lead in now into doing it, like picking a case and doing an immediate implant. Okay. So now we understand what cases we're going to select, right? What are we going to start off with? What's the title of the, the lecture? Immediate molar to immediate anterior. So you don't start with immediate anterior. You don't start with immediate premolar. You start with immediate molar. That is the easiest area to start for implant dentistry. And I know it's funny, me and Haas, one of our hosts was discussing, he's like, I've done immediate anterior and I've done immediate premolar, but I, don't, I haven't touched immediate molar. I'm like, dude, this is going to be a joke. This will be a complete joke. And you're going to slap yourself on the head when you realize how easy it is. But again, for some reason, there's this perception that molar implants are harder to do. Um, and we'll talk about that. But the key is under promise and over deliver. And that means have it in your informed consent, right? So let the patient know what exactly I said. Don't beat around the bush. Just be very honest. You know, it's like when it comes to periodontal disease, you know, it's a periodontal disease when we diagnose it, it's done behind the patient quietly like, shh, she's got four millimeter pockets, uh, six millimeter pockets with bleeding. Don't tell her right? Like, why are we doing that? Just be a freaking professional. Tell your patient they have perio and tell them they need to treat it. It's the same way with implant dentistry. Just say, listen, I'm going to try to do this. It may or may not work, but if it does work, which I will tell you 99% of the time it will, if you choose your case properly and you follow the steps, then worst case scenario, we'll go back and I won't charge you anymore. And we'll save you four or five months of healing time and a second surgery. What do you think your patient's gonna say? Do you think you're gonna get better case acceptance? Um, that's a hell yeah to both those questions, right? So this is why you need to start doing implant dentistry right from day one, immediate anyways. And that's what I did. Um, now don't do what I did, I was a, I was a bit of a cowboy. So um, I'm gonna take you through uh, how you should do it, not my journey and how I did it. Because the way that I did it, quite honestly, was a trial and error period. And as I mentioned, I had my mother praying for every one of my cases, and I got lucky many times, um, whether you wanna call it skill or gifts or, or, or luck or prayers, um, but that's not how I would recommend starting your career in implant dentistry. So the first step, of course, is proper diagnosis and treatment planning. Now, this is, of course, after you've discussed, you've set the bar low, the patient has low expectations. So. We want to take some good external pictures. We want to take some good intro photos. And you want to look at the soft tissue. You want to make sure. Now, this is the beauty with immediate implants. There's normally enough keratinized tissue already there. Unless the patient has some mild recession. But normally, there's keratinized tissue there. When you extract the tooth and you let it heal, you know, there's a risk that you will lose some of that during the healing process. And of course, when we do our incision, we're going to move some of that back. But normally, that's not a problem, OK? Smile line, stay away from anterior. Some of you may have to stay away from premolar because if the patient has a high smile line, they can see the premolars. Those are not cases you want to start off with. Those patients will have higher expectations. And oftentimes they will want a tooth the same day. Um, 2D x-rays, you want to have your standard pan PA. I mean, I have a CT in my office, so that's a standard of care, I believe, just for implant dentistry as a whole, especially when we're presenting the treatment option. But if you want to get quick case acceptance, for those of you who are doing implants, if you want to get better case acceptance, get a CT scan in your, scanner in your office. Um, it will pay dividends. It will increase your case acceptance by 30%. I can put that in writing for you. 
Um, and you know, we went from maybe 200 implants a year right up to 450, 500 implants a year within the first two years that we got our CT scan. Um, but having a PAN and a PA is important for your initial diagnosis. And then of course, getting a CT. Now the problem is if you don't have a CT in your office, you gotta send the patient out. You then have to wait, you gotta get it back. You know, cannery may take three, four weeks. Um, depending on what you're sending it for the for the for the radiograph uh, for the interpretation, um, and at that point you want to determine two things. Okay, you want to determine number one, how easy is gonna is this tooth going to be to extract? Okay, what's your game plan? And then once you have a game plan, what's your backup plan? And then what's your third backup plan? You need to have those already dealt with, right? And then how much bone volume is? So I mean, how much buccal bone is there? Okay, is there an apical concavity or something you need to be, or a lingual concavity for immediate molars? Um, and how much bone volume do you have? Because the goal of immediate implants is number one, to get the tooth out atraumatically, so supporting the buccal plate, okay? And number two, to get your implant stable. And of course, I showed you some cases where you don't need stability, but my advice to you would be get stability. And to get stability with an immediate implant, you either need to do one of two things. Either number one, grab some apical bone, right? So if there's some good bone apical to your root, then grab that. And this is why I'm known as the long implant guy. My standard implants of 13 millimeter, 15. Sometimes I'll use even an 18 millimeter implant because I want to grab the apical bone as much as I can to get stability. Um, or number two, you will use the socket dimension or the width to kind of wedge it in there. But that's a bit more advanced, okay? So for you, you're looking for apical bone. You're looking for a nice buckle plate and you're looking for apical bone that you can grab your implant into or you can drill into and that your implant will grab into because otherwise it's gonna be free floating everywhere else, right? So apical bone is what you're looking for. So remember, what are the patient's expectations? Set the bar low. All the college cases that I've seen and that I've been a part of, maybe personally, because I've, I've had some college, a couple college cases as well, I'm not gonna admit, and they normally call it the 10 year itch, you know, the 10 year case, you get a case of 10 years. I don't know, some people may get one every five years, but most of those are because we haven't managed the patient's expectations. You haven't set the bar low. You've told them something was gonna happen and now it didn't and now they're upset about it, okay? So just an FYI, immediate molar. This, I just drool over this picture, why? Because many of us right now are committing a sin. What is this sin? You're extracting the molar. You're grafting the case. You're letting it heal for four months. You are then placing your implant at bone level. You are then gonna restore the tooth. And because your implant isn't deep enough, the patient now spends $4,000 to have a tooth where they keep getting food impacted around. You've all been there, don't, don't shake your head. All right, you've all been there. So by doing an immediate molar, you are forced to place your implant at the right depth, which is the septum, which is where the two roots join the septum, which is four to five millimeters from the margin of the buccal soft tissue. So because you're placing it at the proper depth, you now have room to develop your emergence profile for your final crown, which means no food impaction. So look at the profiles on these cases. These are just like six of like 200. They all look the same. Look at the shape of the soft tissue. Now, some people talk about shaping the soft tissue after you've done the implant. Why are you putting your patient through all this extra crap? Okay, it should be one surgery. You have a system that has wide healing abutments and healing abutments are things that go on the implant and they cover the implant during the healing process. Um, and so what I love about Hyacinth is they have five, six, seven wide. And I, if you put a seven millimeter wide healing above me, you've already shaped the tissue for your final crown. And it's one surgery, one step. So this is where you need to start, my friends. Immediate molar implants. Now, I'm going to go through this. This immediate molar, I normally do. It's a full day course. So I'm going to give you guys like a crash course on immediate molar implants. The same thing goes with immediate anterior. I don't we, we don't do an immediate pre premolar, but we should. Um, but immediate molar 101, okay? So do, here's an upper molar. How many roots does an upper molar have, right? How many roots? Three, right? Sometimes four. Why is it important to get a CT? 
Because if you look at this case, and this is an axial slice, you're going to see here, um, and I hope you guys can see my cursor, um, we've got the mesial buccal root, the distal buccal root, and the palatal root. As we start going further apically, and yes, I did an immediate molar in this case, there's a huge infection here, okay? You're gonna see that they continue to stay three roots. So when I'm sectioning this tooth, we never grab the molar and try to take it out as one piece, okay? I don't care what they taught you at UWO, you will never do that from this point on. You will always section your molar into three roots, but, there are cases, so this is again an immediate molar, you'll see how I sectioned it into three roots. But look at this case, again an upper molar. But when you look at the CT scan here, what happens? The distal buccal root and the palatal root are joined together. So if you kept trying to section these roots, it would never happen. So by looking at the CT, you can then game plan how you're going to extract the tooth. And in this case, it was more of like an L-shaped uh, uh, sectioning I took out the, the mesial buccal root, and then I did my prep for my immediate molar, um, keeping the distal buccal and palatal kind of joined, and then I took that all out with one piece. Okay, so again, the importance of a CT in diagnosing the case to make your life easier to extract the tooth. You can also look for curvatures in the axial slices and these types of things. So, Dr. Zip Simon, I mean, this guy is just phenomenal. I, I cannot say more uh, great things about Dr. Zip Simon and his and his eagerness to help the dental community. He came out with like a COVID protocol, a whole book um, that he just gave out for free. I mean, this guy's been amazing. Uh, one of my mentors, I don't think he knows that, but I do kind of send him messages, but he talks about the money tooth. And yes, you will all be there. First, the tooth starts off intact. Now it gets a little bit of caries. Then it becomes, the caries gets bigger or the tooth fractures. Now it needs a crown. Then it needs an endo. Now it needs an apico. Now you've got to extract it. Now you put an implant in. Now you make the final implant crown. So there, this is one, why start with immediate molar? Number one, how many times, what do you see most frequently in your office? A molar that needs to be extracted. I would say this supersedes an anterior and a premolar by far. In my practice, I do way more molars than I do anteriors or premolars, okay? So this is just a common tooth. You're gonna see this tooth all the time. And your patients are gonna ask you, can you just do the implant the same day, <laughs> right? So it's so common, right? In fact, now patients are coming in as opposed to doing an endo, and now some are even coming in and saying, listen, I've had a bad experience on the other side, and I just want the implant. Now, I don't agree with that, because I'm still a dentist at heart. I still talk to them about doing an endo or doing crown lengthening, which we all should know how to do eventually uh, in our careers, because I think it's an important aspect of doing uh, general dentistry. Um, but uh, again, this tooth is where you need to start. And I put lower molar, not an upper molar. Upper molar is more challenging. You want to pick a lower molar as your first case. Why? Because there's no sinus issues. Um, they typically tend to be easier to extract. Uh, visibility tends to be a bit easier as well. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of other reasons. But lower molar is where you're going to start. You're going to first start off by assessing the tooth. This is a classic case. So when you look at this case, we're looking here. We can see some good apical bone. We can see some splayed roots, that's good. Okay, uh, this tooth has basically had a fracture, it's non-restorable, uh, the patient was having pain. We look at the cratinized tissue, even with recession, there's some pretty decent cratinized tissue, right? So again, like no need for grafting, you know, gum grafting or any of this kind of garbage, right? Um, so I'm just sizing up the tooth right now, right? So what's my game plan? How am I gonna get the tooth out? How am I gonna get primary stability? How am I gonna do primary stability, you're going to rely on your apical portion of your prep, your osteotomy. The hole that you're drilling, you want to drill apically so you can get some bone for your implant to engage. Otherwise, your implant's going to slip into this spot, slip into the mesial or slip into the distal, right? What's your backup plan? Go deeper. So what if you can't, your implant goes in and it's not working? Well, you need to be able to go a little bit deeper. So when you plan, make sure that if you can't you know, if you can only go so far, you, you know, make sure you still have a little bit more room from the canal, or you can go always a bit wider. So I like a five millimeter implant. What I like about Hyosin is again, they have a great size variation. You really need that. So some implant companies, you know, have a 3.2 and then their next implant is like a 9.0. And I'm being facetious here, but by horizons was like that. They had a 3.6 and then like a 4.5 and there's nothing in between. And that just made no sense. Hyosin has 
a three, a three and a half, a four, a four and a half, a five, a five and a half, and a six and a seven. So if you need to go up just by half a millimeter, you can do that. Um, implant inventory, you have to have the stock. You have to have it. So when you're doing an immediate, you should have about three implants. I normally like one longer and then one wider, okay, as a backup. Now I have a full inventory of every implant that I need, but for your purposes, you know, and, and uh, you know, you should have a few extras. Um, worst case scenario, you can put a cover screw if you don't get primary stability, but you will with the high awesome especially. It's got a nice active thread. Or, and then you can bury it. Or worst case scenario, you've told the patient, listen, we tried and we're just going to graft and walk away. Nothing gained, nothing lost, right? You're just back to the same 99% of the population that's doing that stuff. So here's the adequate inventory of implants. And you should also have an adequate inventory of healing abutments. Why? Because depending on how deep your implant goes, your healing abutment will have to kind of be a little bit above this level of the soft tissue. Uh, some cases, I'll keep it flush with the soft tissue. You, so the first step, one, is you section the crown. You section it right off at the gum line. And some of you new grads are like, oh my God, that's what we need to take out the tooth. <gasps> what, this is like, what, what's happening here? Well, no, you don't, because you're going to section the tooth so that you can make it easier to remove the tooth. And you just follow me here. So I like this carbide fissure burr. It's super aggressive. It just cuts the tooth like butter. You got to be, be careful because it's a very aggressive burr. Okay, but we just section the tooth off. Now we're going to section in between. And what you're looking for here is a little bit of bleeding and a little bit of white to make sure that you're sectioned all the way through. Now I'm going to take this drill, which is from Nobel. Okay, uh, so I'm not averse to using other systems and other drills from other systems. Um, actually, I grew up with Nobel and Implant Direct, um, and I place probably every system out there now. Um, so my, I really love this Nobel Precision Drill because it, it's very sharp. It's got a steep Y factor. Um, and uh, so the protocol that I use is I use that Nobel Precision Drill to just get my initial point right where I want it. And then I use my guide drill, and a 2.0, which is a 2.0 drill. And I take that. So there's my 2.0 drill. And I take down what, again, what I love about the high and it's got stoppers. So it's got like a safety on it. So you can't go deeper than what you want. And I'll put that in, in the middle. And I'm just checking my angulation here, like buccolingual. I can check it mesial distal. Now, this is the importance of why you need a camera. Because your camera can show you that, if you look at this closely, the implant is a bit too distal. And this is a trick that I'm going to tell you right now. Take notes here. Oftentimes, when you're doing an immediate molar, your implant is going to end up not directly in the mesial root, but just distal to the mesial root. So oftentimes, if you're in the septum, you're too distal. Okay, I hope everybody followed that. All right, because typically the molars tend to have a curve towards the distal. And also this drill, you'll, because it has a curve, especially the mesial root, it curves distally, your drill will hit the tip of that mesial root, okay? So oftentimes, I will personally extract, once I've made this hole, I will extract the mesial root and then continue using my drill, leaning it on the distal root and kind of going deeper, okay? Because again, you just keep hitting the mesial root, right? The, the angle, you'll see that shortly. So there you go. You see how I'm in the septum, I'm kind of a bit too distal, but I'm hitting the mesial curvature of the uh, uh, that, that distal curvature of the mesial root right here. So if it's not that much in the way here, but oftentimes it can be quite severe. So I might, you may have to remove that mesial root first. But here I felt like it wasn't that much in the way, so I kind of kept going down and made it larger. So what I like to do is from this point, I will check with a guide pin. And the guide pin from an occlusal, and you need to have an intro camera. I mean, you get so many crazy shots and pictures and guidance. Um, but you'll see that when I look at the guide pin, you can see the wider circle is a five millimeter circle. It tells me where my implant's actually gonna be and you'll see it's too distal. Same thing here, it looks too distal. I can also get the patient to bite down. And again, I wanna make sure that it's hitting the opposing palatal cusp. So these are just things that you can do. This is called the through the tooth method, which I recommend people using when they're doing an immediate molar because the roots guide your drill. So you're not falling into a socket. Imagine the roots were out, and now you have these two holes and you're trying to go in the middle. You're just falling all over the place, right? So um, now I like to take that hole up to the size of a three and a half drill. Why a three and a half drill? 
because the three and a half drill is big enough to make a wide enough hole. Remember now, remove some bone. Do you think it's going to be easier now to elevate the tooth? Yes, because you've removed some bone. It's big enough to remove enough bone to facilitate extraction, but it's still not that big whereby if I need to move the osteotomy, I can still move it around where I want. I can change the angulation or, or the position, maybe move it a bit more mesial. So once I go ahead now and I extract the roots, because now I've had, I have my three and a half drill and look how apical I am. Like that's about a good five, six millimeters of apical stability. Now here's the key guys, listen, listen carefully, listen carefully. Once the roots come out, assume that you're screwed. And what do I mean by that? Once the roots come out, you need to ensure that you have a hole apically so that once you put your next drill in, it has a home to go to. Otherwise, the home to go to is going to be the distal root or the mesial root, right? So you're gonna fall into those. So if you still have a channel apical, then you know for certain that's where your next drill is gonna go. And then you can start enlarging your site and then placing an implant into that hole and it won't fall into the other roots. Okay, so a luxating elevator is really important. A luxating elevator is used perpendicular or sort of parallel to the line angle of the tooth, not a regular elevator. Those of you who do a regular elevator, you're gonna hear this crack, remove some bone. Crack, remove some bone. It's a nightmare. So a luxating elevator and a long surgical round burr. See this burr right here? Okay, see how long that is? It's a super small, like I call it like an endo burr. You literally shove this down and, you're, and you go in approximately. Okay, so I'll go in approximately and I'll actually literally do a crown prep on the side of the root. And some of you are like, well, aren't you removing interproximal bone? And the answer is yes, but as long as you maintain one millimeter of bone on the adjacent tooth, you can remove as much as you want. Okay, so I've removed bone from my drill here and now I'll remove bone along the side of the roots. Okay, and I'll literally go as far down as I can to the bottom of the root. So now it's easy, the, the teeth come out fairly easily. Okay, now remember, when you do section, let me just go back here. If you start elevating this root towards here, because remember it has a distal curvature, it's gonna wanna come out and guess what? The coronal portion of this root is gonna hit, the coronal portion of this root is gonna hit the distal root. So you have to think about that. You have to think about the path of withdrawal. Okay, so that's very, very important. All right, so now, see here, if I didn't remove that mesial root, you can see that distal root would hit the mesial root, right? When it's coming out, it's, it, it wants to curve out mesially for this, this one. So you have to look at the path of withdrawal. Oftentimes, as dental students, or even as dentists, we're not aggressive enough in our sectioning, the, it's not wide enough, and then the tooth just keeps hitting the other tooth, the neighboring tooth or the neighboring root, okay? Once these roots come out, you better hope for damn sure you have some hole apically to go to, to find a hole. Otherwise, you're, it's going to be more challenging for you, okay? So now you make the hole larger, okay? And now we place our implant. Now, you want to place your implant with the hand, sorry, with your, with your hand, um, uh, with your, what do you call it, your motor as much as you can. Because as soon as you start torquing buckly like this, if you don't keep apical pressure, your implant's gonna shift towards the buckle, okay? So you have to make sure you place your implant to depth. And how deep does it go? It can go at the septum, but I like the reference point of five millimeters, four to five millimeters from the margin of the buccal soft tissue. That's where you wanna be, okay? You don't oftentimes get a great torque. Now you're implanting, you can see it's pretty much sitting in the mesial root here, right? Maybe just a little bit distal to it, okay? Now I'm checking my angulation. Again, you can use your fixer driver here, check your angulation. And now, again, what I love about Hyacin is it has a healing abutment measuring device or tool. I don't know what it's called, but it's like a measuring tool. So you literally put this into the implant fixture, push your soft tissue over, and, it, and you can measure the size of healing abutment that you want. In most cases, you're going to use a five millimeter high healing abutment. And for a molar, you want a six or a seven millimeter wide healing abutment. So you measure from the lingual wall because the lingual wall tissue is often the highest. And when you're seeding your healing above it, you will have to remove some bone around your implant. Again, you're not removing the buccal, lingual, or interproximal. You're just removing any bone that's in the septal area to ensure that your healing abutment will fully seat. Okay, so here I'm using a tissue punch with a PRF membrane. 
Um, you don't need a membrane for these cases. You could just literally use a healing vomit or you can put a collagen membrane. Um, and, uh, and I like to put a cover screw on. Again, remember your torts. Don't go crazy with your cover screw. Pack in your bone, and this is just allograft mixed with um, cortical cancellus allograft mixed with um, PRF, although you don't have to use PRF. Um, and then you just pack it in all the way around right to the level of the soft tissue. Okay, because there's this thing called dual zone grafting, where if you put bone right to the level of the soft tissue, you actually will get thicker soft tissue. Okay, and that's a study done by Salama. So now we kind of just remove any bone that's on the cover screw, kind of with a probe or whatever, take out the cover screw carefully. Now you take your healing abutment and you pick it up if you have a membrane there, and then you just put it on the healing abutment. It's okay if a little bit of bone gets in the implant, it's not the end of the world. Um, and this is with the PRF membrane. You tighten it down. And then you tuck the membrane underneath the buccal and lingual soft tissue. So I'll oftentimes just kind of create like a little pouch on the buccal and lingual. And then you just suture it up, just regular simple interrupted or a double simple interrupted suture. Um, where again, you go like a single interrupted, but then you come back again. So the first one's a bit deeper and the second one's a bit shallow. And then you tie off the knots on the buccal. And then that's the final x-ray. So you can see again, we've ended up pretty much in the mesial root, but that is the center. Your center of your implant should not be in the center of the tooth. It should be in the center of the contact point of the adjacent teeth. Okay, the contact point. So you're looking at the contact points here and you're looking for the center of those. Okay, so now we suture this up, send the patient home and say, you're welcome. One surgery, one step in three and a half months. Okay, so this is one week, looks great. This is two months, this is four months. That's what it's gonna look every single time. That's beautiful, That's, you did that in one step, all right? One surgery. And now you put your impression coping in. And again, a high awesome has high impression copings that match the healing abutments. So I can put a six millimeter wide healing abutment. Uh, sorry, impression coping. Um, and this was a case that I posted on Facebook where I compared actually a digital scan case. This is a scan body. I'm doing a digital scan of the implant versus a traditional. So this is the traditional model. And then this is the scan model. And actually the scan implant crown fit better. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so then we just, you know, it's a screw retained or screw mentable crown. We just screw it in, you know, put some Teflon tape, cover it up, check the occlusion, and then that's it. I mean, no fluid impaction, nothing. That's the final crown. So do you think you can do that? I think so. I think so. I think this is very achievable. The second is an immediate premolar. And these ones can be a bit more challenging because again, as you get to the premolar region, you get a bit closer to the sinus, right? So this is a case that I would say you can pick as, your, as an immediate premolar. Why? Because the root looks like it's fairly conical, looks like it should come out fairly easily, right? Looks like there's some pretty decent buccal bone. And look at the apical bone. There's a good amount of ap apical bone. So this is a really nice case for an immediate pre premolar. This case, there is zero apical bone. The buccal plate is ah, it's still not bad, but the sinus is right there. So for me, this is an immediate premolar. For you, this is not an immediate premolar. Okay, this is not a case that you would start off with. So this is a case, again, that has some pretty good apical bone. The tooth is heavily restored, non-restorable at this point because the, you know, clearly there's, I don't care what amount of crown lengthening that you do, it's not going to give the patient a long-term prognosis. Um, and so here's the implant plan. Again, you can see that there's some pretty decent apical bone. And in this case, especially in upper premolar, I like to use the cast kit drills. And for those of you who have seen my sinus or cast kit indirect sinus, those drills are non-end cutting. So you can actually kind of use the cast drill and purposely kind of perforate through or penetrate, I should say, the sinus floor. And why, why do I like the sinus floor? Because look, it's whiter. And whiter means it's more radio opaque. And radio opaque means it's harder bone which means that if I grab into it and I get my implant to catch it, then I'll get a better primary stability. So I'll oftentimes purposely go into those areas. So here's a tooth. And I know all you dental students are like, oh my God, how am I gonna take this tooth out? Oh my God, it's gonna break. So the first step you need to do is just create some space. So section this, because if you start elevating here, you're gonna start hitting the adjacent tooth. So create some space. Then take your burr, that long, small round burr, and sink it in like you're doing a crown prep as far as you can down the side of this root and down the side of this side of this root. And you'll notice when you get your luxating elevator, the thing's just gonna pop out, okay? It's not hard. Now we do our initial drill, 
And you'll notice I'm angled, it's too far distal, right? But I'll use my drill. What I love about using not only a guide pin, you can't really use a guide pin in immediates, guys. I mean, maybe with a molar you can, but with premolars, a single rooted teeth, the guide pin just doesn't stay. So I love using the drills and the drills, because they're long, they over-exaggerate the angulation, okay? So now we have our drill. You can see we're a little bit distal because remember this, the tooth root is not always in the position that your implant should be in. So teeth roots sometimes are like a bit too distal. You can see the root is a bit distal. We want our implant maybe coming a little bit more mesial. So premolars make it a little bit more challenging because you really have to kind of man up and force your, your prep into the right direction. So now we've gone ahead and we placed our implant in the optimal position. And again, one little trick with anteriors and premolars is using a hand driver. It literally looks like a Phillips screwdriver. It attaches onto your um, fixer driver and you can literally just put the implant in by hand and you can maintain apical pressure as opposed to using the torque wrench, which can shift your implant, okay? So the implant premolar, I would say this is a bit more challenging depending on the roots and how much apical stability you can get. Um, okay, but again, we do it the same way we do the molar. Our implant goes in four to five millimeters apical to the margin of our buccal soft tissue. We graft the jump gap. And then we just put a healing abutment. That's all you need. You don't need any fancy thing here, the healing abutment. You know, Tarna showed actually you don't even need to put bone graft in these cases. But I like to. It makes me feel warm and cozy. Four months later, this is what you're going to get. A beautiful picture of soft tissue. You take your impression. Look at the soft tissue. It's gorgeous, right? And now you go ahead and put your final crown in. And again, that's all done within four months. Immediate anterior, the last immediate kind of case that I'm going to talk about. These are more challenging cases. Um, but I will tell you, these cases have the highest case acceptance, all right? Because if a patient comes in or breaks a, molar, breaks a molar, eh, I could live without my molar, I'll chew on the other side, eh, you know, all my patients, I deal with a lot of Italian patients, like, oh, hey, eh, 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 right? But with anterior, you know, they're like, hey, when can I come and get my tooth, right? They want to get it right away. Like, they want to just come in, they want it yesterday. In fact, I've done many cases where they come in in the morning, in the afternoon, I'm placing the implant, and Hisham, I think, you know, we were just talking about something similar to that. You know, he's had similar cases. So these patients are highly motivated. Now, be careful, okay? Set the bar low. Should be a truck driver or a guy with a big mustache who's rolling in. He, you're never going to see the patient again, right? Um, just pick your cases very carefully. But look at this case. The root is positioned so far buckle, and the, the, the plate is so thin that when I extracted this tooth compared to, okay, so let's compare this to a case where the root is not as long. You can actually see the buccal bone looks a bit thinner, uh, it's a bit thicker towards the crest. And there's more apical bone kind of in the area where you can access it a bit easier. So in this one case, here, I lost the buccal plate. I just lost it in the extraction. Maybe I'm not as good as most people to extract, but I had to raise the plate and look at this. This is a nightmare, this is a hard case, right? Or a more complex case. In the other case, I was actually able to maintain the buckle plate. So again, it comes down to maintaining an atraumatic extraction. Um, so the goal is to place the implant. And for beginners, I would recommend not making the tooth the same day, okay? Because that portion is more complex, requires more skill. But if you can take the tooth out and just place the implant and put a healing abutment, and then put the patient in an Essex retainer, um, you know, not a, not a denture. Most patients like Essex much better. Um, you know, an Essex retainer just has, it's like a clear Invisalign with a tooth on it. Um, then I think you're doing the patient a great service because you're four months, you can take an impression and you're still maintaining the soft tissue. Um, you know, if you don't feel comfortable doing a tooth the same day, but the challenge here is staying palatal. So not falling into the socket. So using a burr, um, you know, uh, to maintain your palatal positioning and place your implant palatal enough so that your screw, your screw channel will exit out the cingulum. What I love, love, love is the Lindemann burr or the side cut burr. Um, and that comes standard in the Hyacin kit. It allows you to really kind of drill into the area that you want it to stay into. It's aggressive enough to get in there. Um, it won't, it, you know, your drill won't fall into the socket. And I love, love, love my normal precision burr, which I talked about, because again, it just, it puts you right in the right direction. So if you have a slope and you want to be kind of mid palatal, it just allows you to stick to that position. So this is a case of an anterior patient fractured her tooth. She actually fell on the sidewalk. So we had to extract atraumatically the anterior. And now you're going to see, if you look closely, I don't know if you guys can see this, that little hole 
kind of maybe a third of the way down the socket palatally. That's my little Nobel precision drill, okay? Now we're gonna make that a little bit bigger by using up to our 3.0 drill. And I always under prep a millimeter and I always go more apical. I wanna get as much apical bone as I can. So here I'm just putting my drill in to check my angulation, buccal, lingual, mesial, distal. And you'll see here I'm even grabbing the floor of the nose or the nasal floor that has cortical bone as well. Um, you don't have to go that deep if you don't want to. Now we're placing our implant, we're adding our bone, and now we put our healing abutment. So for those beginners, this is where you would stop. So you wanna choose a healing abutment that's a little bit kind of flush with the tissue or a bit shorter. Or if you wanna take it up a notch, you can put a temporary abutment, trim it, and then make an actual temporary crown for the patient. This is more complex. If you are going to make a temporary crown, we're looking for that reverse S-curve. We don't wanna impinge on the bone or the soft tissue. So these are, again, and then we highly polish that. So, you know, you can put that in and then, you know, this is the soft tissue that you get. But honestly, you'll get something very similar with a healing abutment as well. Maybe not as contoured, but still acceptable. Okay. And then there's her final crown. All right. So an immediate anterior, I think, would be the last case that I'd recommend starting with. Um, uh, just because it's oftentimes in aesthetic zones. But if those are the cases you have and you have the CT and it shows you, you can get the tooth out fairly traumatically, you feel confident in doing that and you have good apical bone. The other option for those of you starting is going guided surgery. So guided means that once a tooth comes out, if you're worried about slipping into a root, you can have a guide made. And by going through that hole, it'll force you to go in the right position. So this is a lower case that I did fully guided. And I, I think I'm gonna post the actual, um, on, on my YouTube channel, I'm gonna post the video for this. But this is an example, like a three, six implant. And this is, this is the CT post guide. I mean, look at that. It's like dead on. Like we were, like there's, okay, there's the before, there's the implant plan. You can see this is where the implant should go in right here in this green section where the implant is. And this is the safety zone that we set. Um, and then there's the CT of the implant afterwards. You can see, look at, there's the nerve. And we're about a millimeter and a half because I like to live dangerously. I set my safe dangerously. I like to, I set my safeties at about a millimeter and a half. Okay, so guided is really nice. You can do the same thing for anterior, where you can again have the anterior um, be fully guided, and it'll just put your implant in the right spot right from day one. And I know Steve Chang's talking tomorrow. He's a huge guru on guided uh, surgery. Um, so uh, you know, where is the hype? Let's be honest. It's immediate anterior. The problem is that when you get a case like this and you know, look, the bone is very thin and you start doing, so this is like, let's say this is the same patient. One, two was an easy extraction. Two, two was not an easy extraction. So at this stage and two, two had a fractured root. Um, you know, if you compare what we did, we virtually did the same thing, except two, two is much more complex because we lost the buckle plate. There was an infection, there was swelling. This is not a case you should start off with. But for one, two, this is totally a case you could start off with. And if you looked at the CT, if you go back, there was, there was thicker bone there. There was no swelling. So just to kind of run through this really quick, okay, we placed our implants. Um, we made teeth the same day, but again, as beginners, you can just put a healing abutment. And if you look at the overall end result, the challenge here is to get the same result on both sides. And that's not easy depending on your expertise in grafting and so on and so forth. So these anterior cases can be very challenging. Okay, and you'll see here, here's the CT of the one, two. I just kind of stayed, I grabbed a little bit of apical bone and the two, two, I had to graft quite a bit. I actually like the way the two, two looks better. Um, you know, so I actually like flapping and grafting because I wind up getting better bone. I mean, of course, if we can stick to a traumatic surgery, then that's what we do. And then these are the final crowns. Um, so I'll just breeze through this really quick. Um, and so this is her one year post-op, all right? So anteriors can be very rewarding, high case acceptance, but at the end of the day, just be mindful that where you should start is immediate molar. Just, you know, fractured cusp. You're gonna see this so often in your practice. If there's amalgam, remove the amalgam first, get rid of that stuff, use the tooth to stabilize your drills, remove the roots, Make the hole a bit bigger, get good apical stability, put your implant in, and then just graft. Okay, tuck it in, suture it, let it heal. After two weeks, it's gonna look like nothing was done. After four months, it's, you're gonna have this beautiful soft tissue as long as you're using good healing abutments. Okay, and then you just take the impression and you deliver the final crown after four months, all in, right? No food impaction. 
Why? Because you place your implant deeper, which is what we all should be doing, even for grafted sites, which we're not, which many of us are not. So are there next levels to the game? Absolutely, right? Where we have no buckle bone, no buckle bone, bone that literally, you know, there's a hole that goes buckle palatal. There's a huge infection on the buckle with a big swelling. Yes, we can do immediate anteriors in these cases and regenerate bone the same within four months. But these are not cases that you would start off with. Same thing with the premolar. This is a premolar, right? If you get huge holes like this, then I would be hesitant on recommending doing these cases, especially you'll see this on CT, right? Same thing here. This is a molar. Look, like 50% of the implants not in bone, okay? Or there's a sinus issue. You look at the case, oh, should I do an immediate molar? Well, you're going to need to do some sinus lifting here, right? So can you do, the, are these cases possible? Yes, they are, but they're not possible when you first start out. You have to get your, your skills up to speed. You have to get a feel for the bone. You have to get good with your grafting and your suturing. But that's why with an immediate molar, the suturing is minimal, the grafting is minimal, and it's very, very predictable. Okay, and this is the post-op CTs for these same cases. You'll see, look at how much we lifted the sinus. The crazy things you can do with immediate implant, which just makes it such an uh, important, uh, such an exciting field. And then, of course, we got the full arch treatments, which, again, that's kind of next level stuff where we can remove teeth or add implants and then completely change the patient's smile and have them walk out with a set of teeth the same day. And that would be the final level. So putting it all together, don't be scared. Okay, don't be scared. The only reason why you're scared is if you did not pick the right case and you are not prepared. Start with lower molars, set the bar low, and put that in your informed consent. Be prepared for contingencies, meaning have the right instrumentation and have the right amount of implants. So, you know, a wider implant, a longer implant if you need it. Look for bone. Where are you going to get stability from? Look, where, where are you going to do that, right? And how are you going to get primary stability? Because that's what you need. You really want to have primary stability because... People always hem and haw, I've seen these cases on Facebook where they're putting a cover screw on an immediate implant. That's a violation of the soft tissue. If you get good stability, put a healing above it. It will maintain the level of the soft tissue. You always get poor quality tissue on a cover screw. And remember, just do it, all right? You just gotta set your mind and do it. And that's what I did. I didn't care, I had done maybe 10 implants or 15 implants, I said, I'm just gonna do it. And I'm gonna start with a molar and I never look back. And I will tell you, your patients will love you for it. You will get better case acceptance. You, it's more productive. The list goes on and on and on. And nobody can argue that it's not a predictable procedure as long as you pick your right cases. So um, for those of you who want to get into immediate molar and implant, you can go on my YouTube channel. And I have a step-by-step -step video on how to do it. So the stuff that I talked about, you just subscribe to the video, subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel, and you can see immediate anterior and immediate molar. I mean, it's as good, you know, I, I think it was Dinesh. Thank you, Dinesh, for taking some of these videos. Um, the All On 4 video is done actually by some guys out in City TV and the Weather Network who help me do these videos. They're very high quality. Um, so again, use these as references. At the end of the day, I want you to be able to do these procedures. And, and that's one of the reasons why in my study club, I do push my doctors to try to do their immediate molars. So these are just some uh, examples of, um, you know, uh, the actual videos themselves and how uh, you, you can kind of see there's some captions here on the steps on what to do and my comments on there and you know, how to place the implant and how to maintain you know, the stability and, and, and so on and so forth. So the videos are really, really helpful tools. Once you're planning on doing a case, watch them like the day before um, or a couple days in advance so that you're prepared to do your cases. Um, and uh, make, so ultimately make sure you visit our site, um, you know, make sure you check out the Facebook, uh, page and again it's got a lot of details on step by step and um, again I do want to reiterate I wanted to thank uh, you know Hisham and, and, and Dentistry Academy for allowing me the opportunity to share hopefully it was beneficial and do make sure you check out we have a, there's a great lineup of speakers I'm excited actually to hear uh, all of these speakers some powerhouses when it comes to implant dentistry and I think our goal is to share our knowledge so that you can learn from our mistakes but also start things a lot earlier and help your patients uh, with better results and quicker results, uh, in, in my opinion. So um, thank you guys for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, and as Hisham mentioned and Has mentioned, I am opening up my group chat. Uh, we have, I think, close to 165 dentists now on that group chat, uh, just uh, at no charge during this COVID period to kind of help benefit 
uh, the dental community. So again, thank you guys, and I hope it was beneficial. Zim, what, a, what an amazing, amazing lecture. Um, I know as a young grad myself, uh, I've, learned, I've learned quite a bit, especially, uh, <clears throat> especially like the atraumatic extractions and like all those tips um, for, for um, implant placement. So I'd be really, really keen to, uh, to know a bit more about the, uh, the program that you're having for, for beginners um, to, to place implants as well, so. Yeah, for sure. Um, no, thank you. So, so before we get into the Q&A, guys, um, just a few housekeeping items. Please mute your mics and videos, and uh, please type your name and email address if you haven't done so already in the chat group for any CE verification purposes. Uh, last week's CE certificates were emailed yesterday. So if you haven't received uh, any, any um, emails or you haven't received your certificate, please email us at info at dtacademy.ca. Uh, all the videos uh, were uploaded already from the previous week to the Dentistry Academy YouTube page. Uh, please subscribe there to receive any updates as well. Follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn to receive all the uh, latest information and updates on our upcoming talks. Uh, and type your questions in the chat page if you haven't done so, and uh, they'll be uh, presented to Dr. Azim. I know there's uh, quite a lot of questions so far, so um, that's, uh, that's great. So uh, to tomorrow on May 19th at 11 a.m., we'll be welcoming Dr. Cease Chang and Stephen Diana to discuss two implant-related topics. Uh, sign up today at dtacademy.ca, and um, as always, the password is TRACK20, all caps. Now on to uh, Puya, uh, Sham, and um, Hass for the Q&A sessions. I just have to ask Haas now, is he going to do an immediate molar? Absolutely. So I was going to make a comment. I was going to make a comment that of the three or four immediate courses I've taken, 90% of the time is spent on immediate anterior teeth. And they make it sound like the immediate molar is the holy grail that you really shouldn't be getting into because that's tough and difficult. And you're making it sound like it's, uh, it's, it's quite the opposite. So yeah, no, I'm totally pumped to, uh, uh, to get going. So, Puya, you want to start? We, uh, we have several questions. Um, go ahead, Puya. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, Azim, that was a great lecture, as everybody said. Very informative. You make it look really easy and say everybody can do it, but we'll see. It takes, I'm sure it takes a lot of skill. Um, so our first question um, is about that aggressive uh, burr that you were using to section your teeth. Um, people like to know what burr that is and what brand it is. Yeah, so that was a Brassler burr, um, and it was, it's their bone cutting burr, I believe. So if you uh, just contact Brassler, um, then I know the, the rep that I deal with, his name is Chris. Uh, you could just ask him for the burr that Dr. Shake uses for uh, uh, cutting. And I actually use that for osteoplasty reduction. It literally goes through like a knife, and it just cuts the bone really quickly. Um, uh, or it sections a tooth. It's not a cheap burr. It's about 40 bucks a burr. But... I mean, it saves me a lot of time and you can kind of use it for multiple uses. So it's from Brassler. Okay, great. And the second question is also about a burr. It's about the small long, long shank burr that you use to remove perimeter bone around the tooth. Yeah, I think that one is also available from Brassler. But I think for those of you who are dental students, I'm sure you, I actually remember that burr from Endo. It was like a long surgical round carbide. It's gotta be a carbide, mm -hmm. uh, super small, maybe like a size two. Uh, carbide burr and I remember using that for like access uh, to find orifices so you, many of you probably already have that burr in your endo kit okay great um, very so, good yeah Haas you want to ask your question uh, sure so I was going to ask and we, we had a couple of people also ask about this and what about if you've got that infected uh, molar site are you curating out are you irrigating are you using any kind of special irrigants uh, yeah so sort of I yeah, I saw the question and people were like, how can you place implants into infected sites? And I think that's a great question, but it's a faulty question because the question is, um, how can we place implants in an area that previously was infected? So when we go ahead, when I go ahead and I open these sites up, if you remember my 12 steps, I split the tissue and I leave all the diseased crap on the bone and then I curette and I use burrs to remove all of that diseased tissue. So that site is no longer infected. All of that stuff is cleaned up. Now we just have holes to deal with, which normally it's horizontal ridge augmentation, which is very predictable. 
So um, I don't use any special irrigants or tetracycline. I'm a very simple guy. I clean it out with curettes. I like burrs, so long surgical round diamond burrs. Um, because diamonds won't cut away the bone, but they get rid of tissue really nicely or a back action chisel. And now I just, now I, now I have an open site. I just kind of place my implant where I want it and then I graft around it. Very good, thank you. Uh, there's another question about, um, is it okay to use forceps after you section the tooth? Um, or is it, are you still better recommending drilling the bone away and kind of elevating the, the, the roots out? So I, I would say drilling some bone away strategically, so either where your osteotomy is going to be, or interproximally without compromising the interproximal peaks of bone. Um, never buccal or lingual if you can avoid it, unless it's got like a thick buccal plate or more so the thick lingual plate. But I really think, I mean, honestly, I can remove every single tooth in anybody's mouth with a luxating elevator, just with a luxating elevator. Now I do have in my arsenal some apical forceps. And uh, oh, sorry, I think they're called root forceps and they're really long, they're skinny, but they're strong enough that you can actually, you know, elevate with. So um, I do have a list of those. Maybe I can try to, they're called apical forceps or root forceps, I guess you could say. So yes, you can use both luxating elevators or root forceps as well, but they're very narrow, very skinny root forceps. Yeah. Great. And um, Azim, uh, Dennis likes to know, um, everything that you use so far, it seems to be very similar to the AstroTech implant system. Uh, have you ever used AstroTech um, in any of your cases? I am not familiar with the AstroTech system, but as long as the so I'm it, these are all these are all Hyosin implants that I've been put, that I, that I showed you in my presentation. Um, I would say, and you can use any system. At the end of the day, my criteria for an implant system is that it's affordable. So with Hyosin, the implant system is extremely affordable. If I drop it on the ground, I get a new one the next day. I don't have to fill out a 10 page form from like I do for implant direct. It has a size variation. So in case I need to jump half a millimeter, not a full millimeter, because sometimes you don't have that bone. And number three, it's got to have an active thread design. So it needs to be active enough to engage, but not overly active, like a Nobel active, which you'll actually chew up bone at the same time. Cause I've used Nobel. Uh, for quite some time. So I would say when you're looking at an implant system, um, and this is one of the reasons why, and trust me, I didn't want to switch. I was happy with implant direct for many years, but the benefits of me moving to high Austin, I literally can, it's for a beginner and it's for an advanced, like, and, and, and it has everything that you need. And that's kind of why I've always stuck with uh, them. And I still highly recommend that system, but you're welcome to use those systems as long as I think you have those criteria for immediates, right? You need those, those qualities in the implant system. Okay, great. Very good. I had a, another question here that I thought was pretty interesting. Placing the impl implant through the root, some studies have shown you can leave the root if it's uninfected or ankylosed. Uh, so basically, you like, can use the socket shield technique in a way um, for molars. Yeah, so, uh, the, so, so the first part of your question was placing the implant through the root. We're not doing that with the immediate molar. We're going to remove the roots, and then we're going to place our implant just into the bone. Um, the socket shield technique, which was developed, you know, Dr. Gluckman and Shneza Pohl, they you know, have done a quite a bit of uh, research and extensive, you know, studies on that. I personally am not of that approach at this point, especially for a beginning. So I don't do it personally in my practice just because I've seen too many shield failures. Um, uh, but also, um, as a beginner, it's already hard to take the tooth out, let alone spending time preparing the shield, right? So... I would advise not going that route initially until you get good and comfortable with just basic regular 101 implant dentistry, which is taking out the full tooth. But there are, I mean, the results are amazing from what I'm seeing with shields, but the research isn't out there long enough as it has been for a full extraction. And I think if you keep your tooth implant palatally enough and you graft that site, then the literature supports you don't need to maintain the shield or maintain a tooth. But I just don't feel comfortable with it personally because uh, I don't want to have a college case where they put, put me on the spot and say, why'd you leave the tooth there? But you can you? Yes, you can. I've seen cases that people have done that. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is about steps after an implant placement. They like to know your steps as to your bone grafting, healing abutment, and membrane placement, your sequence as to how you do that. Yep, so implants in at the right spot, at the right depth. 
Then I put my cover screw. Then I pack my bone. Then I remove the bone on top of the cover screw. Okay, I actually use that, I don't know if you guys remember that probe that I was measuring with my heat for my healing abutment. It's a bit wider of a probe. So I just circle around, I remove some of the bone. I take my driver, I remove the cover screw, and then I take my healing abutment and I put it on and I screw it down. Okay, and it kind of pushes the bone out. Now, before I actually will put the cover screw on, you just have to make sure that your healing abutment seats first. Because you don't want to get to that stage where now the bone's in there, your membrane, you put the healing bone in, and now you take a PA and it's not seated. So this is one of the problems that people tend to have with immediates is putting the healing abutment down. And this is where it's important to really remove the bone. And I, I use that same burr that I described using to remove uh, infected tissue, which is that long surgical round diamond burr. It's like a size six. I just, if this is my implant, I just take that diamond and I really trough away bone. And I'm not removing bone apically prone. I'm just troughing it so that I know once I put my healing abutment, it's going to go down all the way. But those are the steps. Cover screw. So test my healing abutment. Make sure it's, you know, seated passively. Cover screw, bone, remove the cover screw, put my healing abutment, tuck in my membrane, and then just suture, two simple sutures on each side. Very good. And another for, question. And for, and for premolars and anteriors, you don't even need sutures. So... Another question, with adequate interceptal bone in molars, are you using densifying burrs or osteotomes to widen your osteotomy? No, I find for lower molars, you don't need dense. Again, these are just things that you just are buying extra. Like denser burrs are not cheap burrs. Um, so just use your regular implant kit. You don't need to. Uh, the key here is you could, I mean, it looks cool. And I think, you know, people are posting, but maybe if it's soft, like an upper molar, I will use densa sometimes for sinus lifting if I can't use the hydraulic kit, but uh, you know, because you have roots and you have open roots and you can't get pressure. Um, but I would say on average, you're just using your regular burrs and that's normally enough for lower molars, especially. Before we continue on with our Q and A session, uh, it's my privilege to also bring in Dr. Pierre Obaid. Uh, for those of you guys who do know or do not know Pierre, he is a fellow at the, uh, um, uh, the implant uh, what is it, the ICOI, and he's also a, um, an implant guru in so many different ways as well. So um, he'd like to also chime in wherever it is that he can, and I'm going to go ahead and unmute him and uh, welcome uh, Dr. Pierre Obai. Uh, Pierre, can you hear us okay? I can hear you fine. Good morning, everybody. Thanks uh, for giving me uh, a few minutes uh, to talk about a few things. Um, Azim, I, I really uh, am appreciating how you present uh, um, your materials, what you want to say to everybody. I believe it's in a nice systemic, uh, uh, you know, systematic format. And that's what they need. They need step one, step two, step three. Um, but one thing I just want to add, I know we're talking about immediates. It's all right to just take out the tooth and bone graft. Mm -hmm. They have to get really good good at achieving that and, and why I say that is it's pressure enough just to learn about implant dentistry and the proper angulation and the, and the proper depths and so many other complications that come with implant dentistry that the most simplest uh, approach for some will be get good at extracting teeth get good at understanding what bone graft materials you are using and why you're, you're using it, your suture techniques. And once you've gotten to a point where you're comfortable and you see how your hard tissues uh, respond and your soft tissues respond, diving into immediates, you, you just have that much more confidence. So, you know, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate all you guys, uh, uh, you know, gathering uh, of all these uh, young dentists. I'm getting on the, uh, uh, on the other side of, uh, of my uh, practicing uh, uh, time-wise, but, um, you know, I love to see, you know, all these young faces and wanting to learn how to do things properly. So good work, guys. Thank you so yeah, much for that, Pierre. Pierre. Yeah, and, and, and again, I think to Pierre's point, of course, we're talking about immediates and, you know, um, you know, I, I definitely agree with Pierre in the sense that, you know, most people who are first getting out uh, are not going to be comfortable doing this type of thing. They're going to be too, they're going to be sweating their pants, just trying to take the tooth out. And this is where atraumatic extraction and taking these courses is super important. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I, I am a believer of kind of pushing yourself and at least, you know, if you have these opportunities to try uh, and you feel confident, and this is one of the reasons why we have a study club or doing mentorship side by side by an experienced dentist like myself or uh, Stephen Diana, I know offers that peer to peer training that can kind of help to kind of point you in the right direction. And I think that's kind of the important point out of all of this is, you know, yes, follow basic principles, but at the same time, know that there are other things out there and that we are here to help you kind of grow your skills. And it's really exciting, just dentistry, implant dentistry in, in particular, and bone grafting. I mean, Pierre knows there's so many cool aspects to bone grafting that I think you need to learn uh, before you jump into just generally even implant dentistry. So. You got it. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue with the Q&A um, aspect of things. And Pierre, it would be great to have you as well uh, chime in. But before we do so, I'm just going to go ahead and just do a couple of very small housekeeping items. And then we'll go ahead and continue with the Q&A. Um, as we've mentioned, we have tomorrow, uh, both Dr. Stephen Diana and Dr. Stephen Chang will be speaking to us on uh, both implant related topics. To give you guys an idea, Dr. Uh, Steve Chang has been closely watching a lot of these lectures and he's actually decided to pivot his talk um, to something that is new, fresh, and that uh, basically coincides with this entire speaker series. So please make sure that you, you tune in tomorrow at 11 a.m. And as always, the password is track capital, all caps, 20, dtacademy.ca. We're going to go ahead and pass it on to Poya for some more questions. Thank you, Dr. Shurgan. Um, Azim, our next question uh, says, with adequate interceptal bone in molars, are you using your densifying burrs or osteotomes to widen your osteotomy? Yeah, so that was just kind of like the same, uh, very similar to the question that we had asked right before was, I typically don't, unless it's an upper molar, then you can use, uh, and if it, you feel like it's soft bone, then you can use the denser burrs. It's just these denser burrs are not cheap. And so, you know, I don't like to use things that I don't need to. Um, I find that just traditional burrs alone, as long as you under prep, right? So worst case scenario, under prep, you're placing a four and a half or a five millimeter implant, um, then under prep to a 4.0, right? If you're worried that the bone is soft. And oftentimes you'll find that's, that's adequate. Um, but uh, this is where the through the tooth technique really helps by maintaining that bone without having to, you know, remove the roots and then run the risk of fracturing some of the interceptal bone while you're working. Um, so, so yeah. Okay. And the next question is, does it matter about the aggressiveness of the implant threads in immediate implants? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. This is well, one, this is why when I first started doing immediates and, um, and I was lecturing for Nobel, they, we actually had initially it was with the Nobel active. That's pretty much most of the cases I was doing, but, um, uh, the transition was that you need to be able to get good stability. That's the bottom line. So if you don't have a, an, an, an active thread design of some fashion, uh, then you may not get the confidence that you will get when you're doing immediate implants. And that's something that you really need. Um, and uh, what I love about like, for example, the hyacinth implant in like really extreme cases, you've seen cases where, you know, let's say an upper molar, there's only two millimeters of bone or a millimeter and a half. And I'm still getting good stability because the thread design goes right to the top of the implant. So I can sinus lift, I can do an immediate molar and still get like 30 Newton torque with the highest implant because it's got the threads that go right to the crest of the implant. Um, so yeah, I think your thread design is, is important in, in getting success and you feeling confident with getting immediate implant stability. Okay, great. Um, our next uh, question comes from a classmate of mine, Milad, who's actually doing his GPR in Ohio. So shout out to you, Milad. He asks, if you use the five thread guideline for achieving primary stability with immediate implants. Five thread guideline. Uh, so that might mean like five threads that should be engaged in apically. Um, I'm not sure. Does he want to maybe specify on that? Yeah, okay. Says, yeah. I think that's what he's referring to. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not aware of that guideline, um, but I, I will tell people that you really want to get at least a good three millimeters, two to three millimeters. I like three millimeters of apical bone. And if I can get more, I will get more. So if, I, if there's more bone up there, I'll put a longer implant and just get really like more implant stability. Um, so three millimeters, I would say, is the bare minimum that you should get. Um, that will be enough, again, depending on the thread design to be able to get you good implant stability. And remember, like, in immediates, I'm not talking about just placing the implant anywhere. You have to be able to place the implant in the optimal position, okay? So to Pierre's point, I don't want people just getting out there and saying, oh, I'm going to do an immediate molar, and, and, and now, oh, it, it fell over here. I'm just going to leave it because that's what Dr. Shake said. 
okay? You have to put it in the right spot. And if you can't put it in the right spot, then you're grafting, you're walking away, and you're coming back. But when you do come back and you place the implant, don't put it up bone level because you're not creating a proper emergence profile for your crown. And as a result, you will lead, you will have food impaction. And this is the number one complaint with molar implants right now. Well, what, what are your thoughts on that, Pierre? Um, I think to get back initially, what, he, what, he, what it sounds like that five thread rule, you know, I've never read about it, but regardless, when you look at any implant system, if you're going into five threads, you're automatically going to be at least two, if not three millimeters of uh, bone. I would prefer everybody to think about it like that, be in three millimeters of a bone minimally, but more importantly, what was your stability? So even though if you could be in three millimeters of bone, if that implant is a spinner, get it out. And, you know, we're talking bare minimum engagement of three millimeters, plus that has to include of at least 35 Newtons of uh, primary stability. I mean, without those, you're just going to be dead in the long run. Um, but again, you know, I, I stress for everyone that is new on their implant journey or, you know, so again, with, with our study club, it, it becomes, you know, when am I ready? When, when can I start doing this? And the best. it's still a failure. So they have to understand that concept of success, failure, and survival. Just because something has survived, meaning it's integrated, does not mean it's a success. And think about that implant if you want to put it, you know, on someone's forehead. Yeah, I'll get it to integrate, but who wants a tooth on the forehead? Same kind of idea. Yeah, and I think overall, it's important to understand that it's case selection here, right? So if you're planning on doing an immediate molar, you want to basically select your case in order to achieve success. And if you don't feel comfortable, then you don't do it. Um, but if you've placed a good 20, 30, 40 implants and you're like, hey, you know what? Uh, I want to try, you know, I, I feel comfortable doing this. It's a great case. There's adequate bone. I, I push the envelope more than Pierre. I'm not going to lie. And, and I do personally... Um, you know, I don't think I would be at the level that I was or, or doing the immediates that I was if I didn't. Um, but at the same time, I think you know yourself and what your comfort level is going to be. For those of you who are starting out, you don't, right? So you're going to really rely on other people. And that's why it's important to take a training program and be with, you know, leaders like Pierre, myself, or other doctors who can help you in that journey to determine what cases are going to be best for you to start with. Um, but man, immediates are awesome, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I do. What's one thing I do agree with you is that, um, and again, I, I just had this uh, last conversation with my study group. Um, some of my, you know, as far as the, you know, how successful are implants? I mean, we've all read the literature that says it's ninety-four percent success rate, you know, and and there there is the, that abstract zone, but I've showed them my internal numbers. And um, as far as overall percent, my immediate placements have had some of the highest success rates, surprisingly. Yeah. All right, let me step back in here for a moment because we had a couple of questions we still wanted to get through. Shout out to my, uh, my buddy and mentor, Pierre. How are you doing, Pierre? Um, yeah. This is a technical question. Um, why are you placing a cover screw and then changing it to a healing abutment? Why not just place the healing abutment and then pack the uh, graft and membrane around that? So it's a great question. I mean, uh, I like to put the cover screw in first because it allows me to pack the bone a little bit more into that site as opposed to I'm using six, seven millimeter wide healing abutments. So honestly, if you saw some of those cases, once you put the healing abutment, the whole site is sealed. And you know, one of the things that a lot of people talk about is you have to get primary closure around your implant. Well, by placing your healing abutment, 
around, on your implant, you're pretty much getting primary closure. But the problem with doing that is you don't have access to packing in that bone. And it makes me feel nice and cozy when I pack in my sticky bone and I can get it right down in sight. You know, the PA looks better. Uh, actually, I'll use a sticky bone to even gain more stability. And some of you have seen some of those cases where actually I had no stability on the implant and I just used sticky bone itself. Again, these are more extreme cases. So um, that's one of the reasons, but it does uh, you know, give you another point of error. If you put your cover screw too tight, now all of a sudden you pack your bone and now you go to un tighten your cover screw, you can take out your implant. Ask me how I know. So you have to be mindful of your torque. And like Pierre said, you definitely want to get a good 30, 35 Newton torque. And that's not hard to achieve if you pick your case properly, have good apical stability, and you have a good threaded implant, aggressive implant. Okay. Um, Azim, another question that we have is, um, what are some of the reasons failures have happened with some of your immediate molar cases? Again, I'm, I'm, I have not had one failure with an immediate molar implant. I, I, I have 550 cases documented. I have not had an immediate molar failure at all. What I have had was bone, let's say the bone graft had not taken as well as I initially intended it to. So, um, and, and, and again, to Pierre's point, uh, what is a failure, right? Like, uh, you know, it, it is, if, the implant, if the implant's in the right position, uh, then the question is, uh, do we have adequate soft tissue and adequate bone around our implant? So um, the immediate molars that I've been doing, I have not had issues. And I think that to in, in part is number one, getting apical stability. So using cortical bone, like the floor of the sinus, or in some cases, even the lingual plate. But again, these are more complicated procedures. Um, and using sticky bone uh, to graft. Because again, I have the soft tissues typically there. I just need to close the site. Um, so uh, I have not internally, again, just to Pierre's point, I have not, that's the reason why I continue doing the procedure. And again, these are not on my own patients. These are referral-based patients who I'm seeing for these procedures and we're getting optimal results. Um, but they do come with a higher risk and that's why setting up the patient and saying there is a risk that the implant could fail. If you have that concern, number one, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Or number two, you set the bar low, like any case, and tell them, hey, listen, it, you know, some people say, well, you know, immediates are, you know, you shouldn't be doing immediates. But then I argue with them and I say, well, let's see how good you, how predictable is your bone grafting, right? Like you, you, you say, okay, you're going to graft the site. Well, show me all your cases and how much bone you've got and open it up. Okay. But nobody shows me that stuff. So to one point, it's like, let's graft everything and then come back. But the other point is, how do you know how much bone you're going to have? How good you are at bone grafting? Right? So this is why I love the media. It's, is the bone's already there in most cases. You're just basically filling in the voids and using biology to help fill in uh, the, uh, the bone around your implant. Okay, great. I think we have time for three more questions and then we'll wrap things up. Um, we, another question that we have is, which hyosin implants spe specifically are you using for immediate molars? Uh, well, I just use their, their ET3 system, and then they have a, a, a newly, another coded implant called the NH implant, which they say can help to kind of, can kind of improve, um, you know, the loading time. But I still wait four months on all my cases, unless it's a large grafting case, um, then I'll wait five months. But uh, yeah, just their, their high and ET3 implant. Okay. And, and our next question is about the Megagen implant system for immediates, if you've had any experience with it and uh, what your experiences with it is. Yeah, I mean, I've heard some good things about their any ridge implant. Again, if you can't get stability, it's a really, really active thread, like it's a super threaded implant. Mm -hmm. But I just haven't needed to switch. You know, the only time, my justification is why would I, I don't need to try another system with if what I'm using right now works and it handles 100% of the cases that I have. Um, and it's very prosthetically driven. Why? Because it's got healing abutments and impression copings and multi-unit abutments and everything that I need. I haven't felt the need of, of, of moving to a different system, but I've heard good things about it. Um, but uh, again, I don't have any experience myself with that system. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And I think we're getting to our last question here. Um, how many years of experience did you have before you started getting into immediate molars? Uh, well, as I mentioned, I probably, after I had placed my first 20 implants was my first immediate molar. 
So I got in very early. Uh, this was, I uh, graduated in 2003. I took the course with Dr. Zarb and Zosky, the original Dr. Zarb, uh, in 2005. And my mentor, Dr. Jack Zosky, was the one who actually encouraged me to start doing immediates. Um, because he said, you know, Azim, you, it's so hard. And I know from a basic implant standpoint and all the dentists out there, if I ask you to go find a simple case, it's very hard. And to Pierre's point, if you take the tooth out and graft it, that's the best starting point, right? Because then you just have a case that you're dealing with. But, um, you know, my patients, uh, you know, Dr. Zosky, uh, you know, one of the gurus in implant dentistry kind of said, you know, uh, there's a need for this. Um, if you pick your case properly, I think you can have some pretty good success. Um, and worst case scenario, you walk away and that's kind of where I started. And, you know, some are early adopters, some kind of go more traditional technique. At the end of the day, I think I'm showing you, you know, my journey or, 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 or you know, of immediate implants, because that's all I do. Everything is immediate. Um, and, uh, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, with your mentors, you can kind of develop what you feel is going to be best for your practice. You may be nervous doing an immediate implant. Don't do it then. Don't do it. If you don't feel like you have the experience or the know-how, come and watch. Come and watch a surgery, right? Learn. Azim, Azim I'm sorry to, to interject, but I think the real question should have been, how many teeth did you extract before, you know, doing anything immediate implant? And yeah. that's and that's where I can say, I, you know, I, I don't know you very well from a clinical standpoint, but... I can tell that you were very familiar with your oral surgery skills, that that's what gave you that confidence to put them in at 20. Again, you know, I've just seen with, with the group of doctors that, you know, I've, uh, I've been so lucky to speak to, they lack that and they lack that from dental school. So oral surgeries, if you wanna get really good at anything in plant dentistry, oral surgery is the key. That's an amazing point. And I don't know if you guys remember the first case that I showed with that doctor who said, I've taken out tons of teeth and you know, I know I can do this immediate anterior. And she was in that room for 45 minutes, not being able to remove the tooth. And as a result, could not do the immediate anterior. So to Pierre's point, absolutely. You know, you may think you have all this knowledge uh, and, and, and gain, but you, you can't get the tooth out. Yeah, so that's, that's important. Like a GPR and oral surgery would be great too because you don't get a lot of experience in dental school, but extracting teeth is probably the biggest um, Achilles heel for most dentists, especially those graduating. So yeah, great point. Thanks for adding up here. I thank you guys for that. That was all very, very insightful tips. And uh, I know that does resonate with me very deep what you just said too, Azim and Pierre. I do uh, wholeheartedly agree that before placing an implant, make sure that you have solid surgical foundational skills from not just taking out teeth, I think that's a, that's a huge fundamental, but also flap design, suturing. And that's why we, we hit home on, on introducing Dr. Tina as one of our first speakers to talk about the value and how important it is to make sure that you design your flaps well, if that's something that, you're, that, that you need to do, that you suture well, and you know, to make sure that your surgical um, uh, work through is, is, is fine tuned before you go ahead and take on the step of placing implants. Um, so thank you guys for that. Uh, so we're gonna wrap things up for the day, everyone. We'd like to thank our co-hosts for the day, uh, Dr. Has Mustafa, great job. Um, Dr. Ziad Hamad, working behind the scenes tirelessly, tirelessly as always. And of course, um, Dr. Poya Maliki, thank you guys so much for that. And we would like to thank Dr. Piero Bide as well for jumping in. Uh, of course, we would like to thank uh, Azim Sheikh for all of his efforts that he's done through uh, into the to the entire community, guys. This guy is working around the clock from you know first thing in the morning all the way to late nights. How can I help out my community? How can I help out our fellow dentists or the individuals that we're mentoring? So thank you so much for everything that you do, Azim. Uh, this lecture, as always, is, was absolutely fantastic, but I cannot thank you enough. And I'm sure a lot of our colleagues resonate the exact same message. Everything that you do um, for us as, as dentists, for people that you're mentoring to the entire community itself, thank you. And uh, we're looking forward to continue to see you. And we're looking forward to you know meeting, of course, and, and having these conversations in person in the next couple of weeks. Um, so once again, thank you everyone for joining. Stay safe. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 11 a.m. And have a wonderful, happy Victoria Day. Have a great day, everyone. Take care, guys.